Buenos dias, mis amigos. Okay, this morning I'm going to go over the criteria that I laid out yesterday, and I want to kind of go over um, a little bit more in detail. It's interesting to me because the idea, everything that came to me was while I was in the shower. And so I come out and I, I throw the ideas out, and then that way I can expand upon them later. And that's what I want to do this morning. First of all, let me get to this comment. It's it's pretty interesting here. Vernt says, just another random comment because I don't have Facebook or I would message you there, but I was just on some random live streams of people talking about the Bible, trying to spread the good news, and I find it amazing how all these people are almost hateful when we are trying to tell them that salvation is for everybody and it's as simple as just understanding that you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of of heaven and to be born again of incorruptible seed is a free gift for just having faith in him and not yourself I was just like them a few months ago but now that I see the truth it's really a struggle to get people to really realize how easy it is but then again I guess some people just have to go through fire to actually realize what is real and what isn't oh and second John chapter 1 verse 7 Jesus Christ is come in the flesh notice the tense is not was not will be is also Acts 17 verse 27 all right should we go to James uh, what am I looking at here? Oh, I, for, I'm sorry. Second John seven. <laughs> Second John one. Let me go there first. Second John one, and then uh, Acts seventeen twenty seven. I want to go to Second John because just to make sure he's not pulling my leg here. All right, so what happened? I, I got the wrong verse, don't I? Second John 1, 7. Second John 1, 7. For many... Oh, there we go. No, this is right. What am I looking at here? For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Yes, yeah, so that's a great point, really, because Jesus is come in the flesh. He's came in the flesh. He was. He came into our body. Our body is the temple of God. He destroyed this temple and rebuilt the temple into a incorruptible flesh, an incorruptible temple. And ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return for us. And when he returns, we will be changed in the in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And we will be changed from this corruptible flesh into the incorruptible flesh. Okay. Alright, so I appreciate I appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. So Jesus, he has came into our body, into our flesh, and he has led the way for us. Those of us that are his followers, we will follow the path that he has led for us. Right now, um, what I, in my just my opinion here, Vern, is that really you have to hit rock bottom and you think about all these people they they grew up in the church and uh, you know they they went to seminary school when they were 19 year old snot nosed kid and they learned all the the secrets <laughs> and now they got the degree now the people that own the churches they can look at their resume and say oh this kid has a degree 
let's put him in charge of that church. Regardless of whether he understands anything or not. It doesn't even matter if he's he's got himself a napkin or a Kleenex to wipe his nose off with. He's got a good resume. He's going to lead that church. And in other instances, if, if uh, you know preachers have enough money, if they're rich, then they can uh, obviously have their own church, buy their own church. But one common theme all these churches in your community is that none of the leaders have any understanding at all and they all fall within the the cat the criteria that I laid out yesterday and that I'll I'll go over here today and that's exactly what the Bible warns us of that's exactly what the Bible says will happen and is happening. All right, so again, I think people have to hit rock bottom and realize, man, I can't do it. I can't do it myself, right? Jesus has not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And, of course, we know that there is none righteous, only God, right? So, the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ being the Savior, the Messiah. And of course, most people today think that they're good enough to go to heaven, and they're not. <laughs> um, it's amazing. It really is. It's a... It's, uh, it's a spiritual thing. It really is. It's a spiritual thing. People just can't see. People that don't believe just can't see it. It's a phenomenon, really. All right, so I appreciate that. It's a, that's a good observation. Um, man, I tell you. I know. I, I feel like people just ain't, ain't going to buy what I'm selling here. But I know it's true. All these leaders... In these churches in your community my community your community none of them are saved I don't know that there's even one leader of any church anywhere around the world that is a saved man they're all corrupt and they all lack understanding all right so let's get into this Alright, so I want to start off um, by going to 1 John chapter 5. Let's see, how can I do this here? Let me do it this way. I want to show you something very, very odd. You probably already know, my guess is, if you're, if you're a student of the Word of God... You already know this, but if you're not, you might find this particularly interesting. Oh, how do I do this now? Let me leave that right there, okay? First John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now there's a difference. Three bear record in heaven, three bear witness in the earth. Okay. Before I get into that, let me, oops. Let me show you something here. Okay. How do I do this now? How do I do this? It's astonishing, really. It's incredible. I don't know if you've ever done this before. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not everybody knows, right? 
In verse 7, 3, bear record in heaven. Verse 8, 3, bear witness in earth. All right, so let's take a look at what the other translations say. They amplified. Oh, there are three witnesses. What? That's your that's your perfect word of God. What in the world? What is going on? Well, what these guys are doing is exactly what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden when he whispered into Eve's ear. Yeah, has God said, getting Eve to doubt. The Word of God. So that's exactly what these modern translations are doing. Exactly. It's an old trick. What you do is you cut out part of the Bible and say, Yeah, well, no, we got some manuscripts here. You've never seen them before, but we got them. And they don't say the whole thing. They only say part of this. And so, yeah, has God said that? Well, we don't know. We got manuscripts that says otherwise, so we don't... Nobody knows what God really said, so we're going to go with this and create confusion in regards to the Word of God. These people are insane, okay? They are insane. Do not follow them. Do not go after these strange perversions of the Word of God. This is insanity. It really is. There's no way you can have one of these versions and say, oh, that's the perfect, pure word of God. There's no way. It's not possible. And you can't believe the Bible you hold in your hands if you don't believe it's perfect. Okay? These people are all that this is fantastic look at this what in the world who has time to read all that uh, yeah I don't want to say nothing and get started on that one and a NASB do you read the NASB they're one of the insane maniacs NIV. Same thing. Okay. The New Living Version. There are three who speak of this in heaven. The Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. All right. The NLV, no good. Believe me. All right. And I'm not going to cover each and every one of these. And look at this crap right there. Shalasha. You know what a shalasha is, right? I mean... The King James Bible is too hard to ring, uh, read, right? It's too hard. Nobody can understand what King James Bible says. This, now, this is easy to understand, right? Because there are shalasha shash, given shalasha shash, shalasha shash. Huh? Easy. It's so easy, it's stupid. All right, and then, of course, verse 8. And what they do, this is a cute little trick that they do. All right, so they, like the, what am I looking for? Complete junk, Bible, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. Oh, okay. Oh, they agree. Oh, I didn't know that. And the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. Oh, well, hey, that's strangely familiar with the complete junk Bible the ESV where's that okay all right and then so let's go good night where's Phillips at there's Phillips it take you 20 minutes to read that verse take me a lot longer than that because I wouldn't read it. Alright, so and then the NASB, the Spirit and the Water and the Blood. And the three are in agreement. Wow, isn't that amazing? It's like, how is this possible that all these 
pull the same little trick. Well, it's because they're all corrupt. They're all corrupt. You notice here that the spirit, the water, and blood. Spirit, water, and blood. They removed heaven. They removed the Father. They removed the Word. And they removed the Holy Ghost. All right, so let me <clears throat> get into this here. All right, so there are three, uh, three criteria to know who's not saved. In Matthew 7, we are warned of wolves, wolves in, I thought, yeah, ravening wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of false prophets. False prophets are false teachers of the Word of God. We're being warned. This is not in vain. This is something that we should be very serious about. When it says beware, that means beware. This ain't just throwing crap on the wall and see if it sticks. This is a stern warning for those of us that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew 24, when Jesus is asked about the sign of his coming and of the end of the world, the very first thing he says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying that I... Jesus am Christ and shall deceive many. He's not warning us against atheists and, and evolutionists and Satanists and uh, the globalist and you know the the Jesuits and the you know uh Oh, whatever they all you know those those guys the, the Alex Jones types right this is a warning about those people that are gonna stand behind the pulpit those people that are gonna pose themselves as teachers of the Word of God. Those guys that you see on TV, they're easy to, to distinguish, but it's incredible how many followers they got. Well, those followers aren't no different than the followers of these people in the local communities. They go to church on Sunday. Why? Because they love the Lord, right? They love the Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Is that why they go? Or do they go because they want to feel good about themselves? It's a feel-good church, isn't it? You, you've been to them. You go there and you feel good about yourself. And you're like, man, that was money well spent. Right? That's what it's all about. It's not about the truth. It's about feeling good. It's not about the spirit. It's about the flesh. And this is what we're warned of all throughout the Bible. I mean, look at this. I mean, I don't know how you miss it, man. Many false prophets shall arise. If you understood this word as prophets as the same thing as preachers and pastors, maybe you would have a better understanding of what we're being warned of. What do you think this is? The, the kind of people that crawl around on the streets like the, the guy that uh, the guy that kidnapped Elizabeth Smart? Oh, he called himself a prophet. Oh, this is this is what Jesus is warning us of. No, 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 no. That, that, that guy, that, nothing. Nothing, man. That guy ain't nobody. Prophets. These guys are in your churches. 
if they weren't, there wouldn't be a need to warn us about these guys. This is not about Elizabeth Smart's abductor. This is about Reverend Smitty. He runs the whole show in your church. And this is not a few of them. Well, there are going to be a few of these guys. They're, not, they're going to be everywhere but where the church that you go to. I mean, surely. Right? I mean, God wouldn't do that to you. Well, no, God wouldn't, but Reverend Schmitty would. Because he wants the money. And he's very slick. Many. Now, this is a many. That's a word that you should not take lightly. All right. And, oops, I'm sorry. One more time. In verse 24, false Christ, this is directly in relation to the popes in Rome. Nobody else in the world, nobody has ever called themselves the representative of Jesus on earth and had a great following if you look up how many Christians are in the world today it says two billion well no that's that's a number according to the Roman Catholic Church they're claiming that Christians are Catholics they're claiming Mormons are Catholics they're claiming Catholics are Christians and we're not the same. They're not even close. That's, you know, you think about all the verses and that are warning us of the Antichrist. And then what What do you think, man? What are you? What's going on in your head? You think that, well, Jesus just, he didn't know. He didn't say anything about the Antichrist. That, that's what you think? You think the Lord Jesus Christ had no idea that there was coming an Antichrist? No, he knew exactly, and this is why he's warning us. False Christ, false messiahs, false representatives of him. Now, of course, in order for the popes in Rome to gain in power and influence, the rest of the world has to be blind to who they really are. If everybody knew, they wouldn't have any power at all. Because we're increasingly, as, as humankind, as mankind, becoming more and more blind to the fact the popes in Rome are gaining and gaining in power and influence all around the world. All right, and false prophets, again, false teachers of the Word of God. And shall show great signs and wonders, if it were so, and, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Again, we're being warned of deceivers. Behold, I have told you before. All right, it's incredible, really. It, even let me show you one more verse here. Evil seducers shall wax worse and worse. Evil men and seducers, excuse me. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The deception is growing and growing and growing to a point to where if God allowed things to play out the way that they are, there would come a point to where there would be nobody saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay? In Matthew 7, you know, again, we're being warned of false prophets. And then again, and, uh, let me, first of all, verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. And what it's what they're teaching. 
is how we know that they're not saved. That's how we know that they are false prophets, ravening wolves. By the things that they teach. We can't know who's saved, but we can. Sh we sure can know who's not saved. You're darn, you better darn well believe that. You better darn well know that. That's why we're being warned. So that we can know and we can see it for ourselves who the deceiver is. We that are born of God, we know the truth. We know the truth. First of all, <clears throat> excuse me, in John chapter 8, and ye shall know the truth. Jesus says, ye shall know the truth. If Jesus says, ye shall know the truth, then doggone it, you're, you should know the truth. You shall know the truth. We can know the truth. The truth is not, anybody that says the truth is not noble, they're a doggone liar. Ye shall know the truth. All right, and then, of course, Jesus promises to send the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, and the Spirit of Truth dwells in us. Even the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive. The, uns the unsaved people, the, the, the false prophets, the ravening wolves, the deceivers, the evil men and seducers, they cannot receive the spirit of truth. But those of us that are born of God, we have it in us. We dwell in it, and it dwells in us. Right? Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but ye know him. Ye know him. You know him. For he dwells with you. And shall be in you. All right? So we got the truth. Don't give me none of this. Well, we just can't know. I mean, we got experts and scholars. And we got archaeological list. And we got all these people looking into it. And we just don't know yet. We haven't figured it out yet. But as soon as we figure it out, we'll tell Dan Rather. And Dan Rather will tell you on the, the 6 o'clock news. No. No, 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 no. The spirit of truth is in you. It's not in Dan Rather. It's not in experts and scholars and theologians and all these people. It's in you. You can know the truth. You've got access to everything you could possibly ask for right there in your hands. There's no special knowledge that these people have access to you know it, you, it's not like well you got to go to school for 22 years to know what God really says no 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 I mean that's what they want you to think right because if, if you believe that then they got power over you and you're depending on them to know what God says right Second Peter chapter 1, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You don't have to go to seminary school. You don't have to go to Bible college. You don't need a degree. You don't need a master's in BS or whatever. All you need is to believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. So let's go back to 1st John chapter 5. Let me open this uh, the whole chapter up. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Alright, so again, the Word. The Word. In John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? The Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We got three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. 
So the word, the word of God is God. The Bible that you hold in your hands is God. Comes directly from God, and it is God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You believe that? It's not just words. If you don't see it, man, there's there's a reason for it. The Word of God is powerful, man. I mean, what's the matter with you? You don't believe in the power of the Word of God? You know, there's something wrong and something revealing if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands comes from God. All right, think about that. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, you believe God can resurrect you from the dead. But God can't give us his word in our language? That's odd. It's odd. It doesn't ring true to me. There's something wrong with that idea. In fact, it goes against the Word of God. In verse 8. How hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? The Word of God transcends all languages for all time, forever and ever heaven and earth shall pass away but my words will not shall not pass away you believe that but you don't believe god can give you his perfect word in your hands man there's something wrong something wrong and something revealing when people don't believe that. Anytime anybody points to the Greek and Hebrew, it's a red flag. They only do that because they don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. You know, if I'm talking to you one-on-one, -on -one and you say, well, the Greek says this, and the Hebrew says that, you know what, I don't know Hebrew, and I don't know Greek. I don't know Japanese. I don't even know Spanish. I barely know English. Why in the world would you be pointing to these foreign languages if you believed the Bible that you have in your hands? Let's say I'm holding a Bible and you're pointing to the Greek and Hebrew and I'm saying, look man, the, my Bible ain't got no Greek. So you saying I can't trust the Bible? I can't trust the Word of God? Is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm not going to say that because that would be too obvious. I'm going to spend a few words here to get, make you even more confused than you already are. No, these guys are liars and deceivers and we're being warned over and over and over and over all throughout the Bible about these guys. And it's getting so bad that we're getting to a point to where nearly the whole world is deceived and if God lets things play out the way they are with the wickedness or the deceivableness that's in the world the deception is wicked with it increasing worse and worse there's gonna come a point where there's nobody on earth that is saved 
So if Jesus is coming today or tomorrow, very soon, then that can only mean there are very few people in the world saved. And there's no guarantee that there's even 10 people in the world today that are saved. Really, there's only a guarantee that we have two people that are alive and saved in the world today. That's, that's the only guarantee. Because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says, um, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, then we, meaning two, there has to be two, then we which are alive and remain. All right, so there has to be two people that are alive and saved when Jesus comes. There's no more guarantee than that. In the days of Noah, there's only eight souls saved. In the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, there wasn't even ten righteous. You know, they pull, pull Abraham and Lot out, and they ain't got nobody righteous. There one, not not even one. And of course, you can make the argument that even Abraham and Lot weren't righteous. There's none righteous but God. All right, so that that's one of the three criteria. People that don't believe the Word of God, they're not saved. People that don't believe the Bible that they hold in their hands, they're not saved. People that point to the Greek and Hebrew, they're not saved. They're ravening wolves. They look like one of us, but they are not one of us. Okay. Now I'm going to wrap this up. Maybe, I think, maybe tomorrow I'll focus a little more either on the Father or the Holy Ghost. All right. Um... Let me make this real simple, real quick though. The Father, if you think about Isaiah chapter 9, where Jesus is referred to as the everlasting Father. Right, I'm, having, I'm doubting myself. I don't doubt Jesus at all, but I do doubt myself quite often here. I'm doubting myself. Is it in chapter 9? Doubting myself big time right at this very second. No, okay, I got, I got lucky this time. Okay. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, unto, and the government, I'm sorry, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Okay. So, think about this. Jesus being the everlasting Father. Why do we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it to make our life better now? Well, that's what Reverend Schmidt says. You believe in Jesus, he'll make your life better now. That's what uh, Joel Olstein says. Your best life now. Why? Because you're going to hell later. But why do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, let me just say why I believe. It's because this world is full of wickedness. I want no part of this world. I want a world of everlasting life. Without the wickedness that we endure in this world. The everlasting Father promises us everlasting life. That's why I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All these preachers, Reverend Smitty, are they teaching that? No. Not at all. And most of them that I've shown, like I've shown you for the last couple of years, they're preaching this idea of a bonus thousand years. And a couple of the honest ones, they'll say, well... When Jesus comes, I'll be restored into my 20-year-old body, and I'll have dominion over all these unsaved women, 
and I'll be having relations like I did when I was 20 years old. I'll be on the go, go, go. That's why they believe in this thousand years. It's the only reason they believe in the thousand years. This idea of a millennial reign, the only reason they believe it is because they're looking forward to a thousand years of dirty, stinky sex. That's it. And of course, we're warned of that over and over and over and over. And all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible. Knowing this first, that in the last days, mockers walking after their own lust. Okay. And then now the Holy Ghost. I stopped myself there because that'll be another 20 minutes if I go that direction. The Holy Ghost. Grieve not the Holy Ghost, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Once saved, always saved. The preaching of the cross is to them foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. All right. I, I shouldn't do this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, we are saved right now. We are saved, see, uh, saved, secured, sealed, stuck, sanctified forever. Notice I, I added that word stuck. Because once we're saved, we're stuck. Stuck, Chuck, you can't get out. There's nothing you can do. You're saved forever. You can't wiggle, squiggle, squirt your way out of it. Not possible. You're stuck, Chuck. Once saved, always saved. Once you are born of God, God can never die. So you being born of God, you can never die. It's, it, it's not complicated, man. It's not rocket science. But all these unsaved devils... They'll try to convince people, hey, why well, you can't you can't be saved. Nobody can be saved. And nobody knows if they're gonna be saved until judgment day. And so theoretically, if you're saved right now, you better kill yourself because you might lose your salvation. You might get hit in the head and go crazy, lose your mind. And go get and lose your salvation. You know, think about these people that have strokes and they they get dementia and, and these sorts of things, and they think it's thirty years ago, and they can't quite comprehend. So, let's say somebody gets saved like a year ago, and then they develop dementia. And they have a, you know, or they have a, a stroke and, and they, they think it's 30 years ago. And they think, well, they don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I never said I believed in Jesus. And they're angry with God and they don't, you know, they don't believe. They, they were, you think all of a sudden not, they, they lost their salvation because they got hit in the head or they had an injury of some sort. No, 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 no. No, there's a difference between the flesh and the spirit. Once you are born of the spirit, that's it. You have eternal life that lasts forever. Whosoever drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. You don't even know what that water is. If you're if you're going around saying you can lose your salvation, it's not rocket science, man. It really isn't. Those of us that are born of God, we know that we have eternal life. We know. We know. People that don't believe in once saved, always saved, they don't know. If they're going to live forever. Well, yeah, pretty pretty simple, pretty easy to see that they're not saved at all. 
if you're not once saved, always saved, you're not saved at all. All right, and so the Holy Ghost, grieve not the Holy Ghost, whereby ye are sealed, or the Holy Spirit, same thing, sealed unto the day of redemption. You're sealed. Sealed, stuck, saved, secured, sanctified forever. All right, so, all right, that's it. Uh, to me, it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> very, very interesting. Why are these two verses being attacked by the unsaved? Is, is it just more than, is it, is it more than just creating doubt? Because they don't, they don't know. Or is there something very much more spiritual going on here? And you take away this. If you take away verse 7, you're taking away the criteria, aren't you, for salvation? 